Uh, welcome back to the NoFX podcast. Uh, it's been, what, about a month probably? I, I'm not exactly sure. Apologize. Uh, I did take a bit of a vacation from making content, but we're back in full swing, trying to get uh, back on track, back to the bi-weekly schedule. Uh, this episode should come out within the next few days from this recording, and then uh, we'll be back. You can expect content every couple of weeks. Uh, we actually had a different episode planned today, but uh, our guest that was going to help us talk about the discussion ended up having some family come in from out of town kind of unexpectedly, and they uh, had to back out. So we are going to jump back to our series of lists where we have mm. been talking about the best cards in particular categories uh, for each color in Wooburg order. So... We've already covered creatures, we did instants, we did sorceries, uh, and then we haven't touched on this for a few episodes because we had other things come up. Uh, we are probably, hopefully, fingers crossed, we're going to try and get the episode that we had planned for this week out to you for the next episode, and that shouldn't be an issue, I don't think, and then maybe we'll come back and finish off. We only have a couple more in this series that we're going to do, so we would like to try and kind of finish that up here in the next couple months, so... Uh, hopefully you guys have been enjoying it, uh, and you know if you have feedback uh, on anything that you think that we missed, you know of course disclaimer we are using our own opinions. These are mostly cards that we play ourselves or we see enough of in our own online and local metas. So your mileage may vary, and uh, they're not going to be in any sort of particular order. We're just discussing things that CCDH play, and uh, I'm assuming that you will agree with most of it. But again, feedback is. Uh, requested and always appreciated speaking of which Absolutely. we have a couple of comments that were on our lord of the rings set review that we're going to go ahead and read off now kirk you want to take the first one there absolutely so the first one was from i messed it up i don't know how i could but it's the card slinger i probably just don't sound cool enough saying it uh they said uh great discussion and they said they feel orcish bowmasters is going to warp the format and they think that flowering of the white tree will be a slow burn for CDH as the ward one will limit Bowmaster's shenanigans to how much mana Bowmaster's player has open, which will help decks like five color sissy keep sissy keep their board presence as they assemble a win. So um, I think the last video, correct me if I'm wrong, we did was Lord of the Rings review. Yeah, Sound that's, right? that, that is why they are discussing those cards. Makes perfect sense. Um, I would agree. Orcish Bowmaster's is seeing play everywhere. Does that make it format warping? It's hard to say. I mean, a card that shows up in, you know, probably a large chunk of the black decks, I would say in some ways absolutely is. Um, I think wheels were kind of on the decline. I don't know if they're back on the incline now, if they're still kind of where they were at before, but I definitely see a whole hell of a lot of Orcish Bowmasters. And so, it's definitely a card you got to think about now. So I think it's, it's on everybody's mind. I think that it was highly rated by us and other people, but I've also heard whispers about it being sort of not as good as people initially thought um the first game that i played it in was with you on stream with your brother you guys can see the video on my channel um i cast it into your brother's uh <laughs> peer into the abyss and because <laughs> yes, peer into did. the abyss says draw cards he still got to draw his cards but then i got to deal it was like 48 damage or something on um, top of amassing 48 you know strength in orcs and I, I, my orc army at that point was already like 16 or 18 uh power and toughness uh we managed to get that thing up to 69 69 and then we stopped because you know memes but Reason. uh right it single-handedly killed him wiped the board well it was gonna wipe the board but you had some sort of answer uh and i think then, i had an indestructible witch king anyway yeah, um, it didn't kill his commander, but it killed everything else, and then um, it did some face damage, and I probably could have won if other things had gone my way. I didn't get the win, but, you know, spoilers, sorry. But uh, yeah, it still was very effective, and um, I could see it being a thing with wheels. I don't know, again, we, we, I don't think anybody has the data yet to know if wheels are going to make a big comeback it also sadly we were very up on pier again because of the whole uh, hoarding broodlord combos that we could do with it now um and then orcish bone masters kind of makes it feel bad again <laughs> it, 
it's like you can get deflecting swatted or bow mastered and you just die. But, you know, I mean, it's just a tool. It's just another thing. And I think it kind of was looked at the same way that, like, Ledger Shredder and, like, Fairy Mastermind and some of these other cards that have come out recently that have that same line of, like, if X thing happens more than once by tar or by any opponent, you do X thing. I think that that kind of makes it where people automatically thought it was going to be good, but also kind of makes it to where it is almost kind of a staple because you can literally jam it in any black deck. You don't care if you're playing wheels. Somebody else might be. Somebody else might be just be playing a Ristic, and we already talked about where, you know, it just slowing down the Ristic player is probably good enough. Yep. And two bodies for a Timna, et cetera, et cetera. Two bodies to convoke, cast your Hoarding Brood Lord. You can hey, convoke, you can sack, exactly. sack it to something else. You know, there's a there's a ton of things. But yeah. uh, the card is quite good. Uh, the Flowering of the White Tree, that one I have not run into yet. And it did not, spoiler alert, make our list today. So maybe we're undervaluing it at this point. Maybe um, we're overvaluing it. Who knows? It was on the honorable mentions because of me. And that's probably why I got commented on. I feel that it's a really good card. It is a slam dunk and Sithis especially or any other enchantress deck that is on white. Um, I also think that if you're on a legendaries matters list, it is a nice little anthem, uh, but it also hits your other creatures. <laughs> so it's just a nice little anthem. If you're combat oriented, if you're a combat, he stacks deck, but I liked the, uh, the, point that was made here you know that the mo masters itself can be kind of slowed down by that card in particular so it is sort of tech for that and that wasn't something i thought of prior but it's a good point because ward one to everything means if they don't have the mana they don't actually get to do anything with those draws so <laughs> at least not targeting my stuff which means it is protection against it whereas you know maybe everybody else's board gets picked off instead and i'm happy with that and I mean, I like the the call out for like the five color sissy. I never thought about like you could tutor this up as pseudo, you know, counterspell if they don't have the extra one mana to dump into it. And also, it's just the color identity. I and mean, she's white already, so I guess the color identity doesn't matter. But she plays but legendary still, creatures, so, so. it can it also go in. Sol- yeah, well, and it can also go in like Selesnia sissy because it runs a ton of legendary creatures because it its tutor clause is legendary. So I think in those True kinds that. of decks, it's it's pretty good, but. The plus two, the plus two plus one on the Sissé Weatherlight Captain, the five, the five color Sissé is also pretty good for its tutor. Yeah, that's pretty good there too. Anyway, go on. What's uh, what's the next comment we had out there? Um, and then we had a comment by uh, Death by Food Tray, which said, uh, "Great video, podcast, and keep up the great work." Uh, they pretty much agree with everything that we said. Uh, he thinks that Orcish Bowmasters is going to be a big deal in CDH, and is especially hyped to actually cast it in their uh, Nixilis Kingpin deck. So that was a deck. Very good in that deck. Very freaking stupid good in that deck. Yeah. Um, they said there's two cards I'm pretty curious to see what impacts they have, and it is uh, Gandalf the White, which we didn't really talk about much because I kind of vetoed it, and then it ended up being a thing where people are actually talking about it maybe being pretty good. Um, I think I've seen it play in the... Didn't it make some CDH tournament, like a top four in a in a white mono-white Heliod deck that was their spicy tech? I th- think you might be right, but I'm not entirely sure. But um, they said that it looks like a fun deck to build, especially as a stacks deck with Flash, which, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, the other card that they wanted to talk about was Mirkwood Bats, uh, which they don't think will see play widely in CDH, but... Uh, they're thinking that it would go really well in something like Corvold uh, and be absolutely terrifying. I agree, Mercoid Bats. I think if you're making a ton of, tr- of tokens of any type, it doesn't matter. Like, a, even... I mean, it's, it, I think it's going to see more play in casual. I don't know that it's ever going to make it. Like, I haven't put it in any of my decks, even though I think it's good, because you're just not reliably making the tokens. But if you're in um, any deck that's like aristocrats that's making like I sack this thing and then a creature comes in so I sack this thing deals the damage to everybody and then that creature dying creates another body that I can then sack and then you know I can reanimate that and over and over and over Um, it's a slow burn but it is faster with this on top of other aristocrats effects Um, it's also common so it sees play in CPDH already I'm already running it there but uh, Corvold Corvold uh, would, would definitely to put in some work with that it definitely would prosh corval the one i'm really really considering brewing and throwing this in uh that somebody mentioned that they thought would be great in is, is chatter fang so that could be I, very I fun was, in that i deck. was legit gonna say that <laughs> and then i sidetracked myself but yeah chatter fang with uh the academy manufacturer and just uh your um 
I mean, it's win more, but you already have the <laughs> infinite with the the black pirate. Well, and it and it, it is being a four drop. It dodges like a uh, calling ritual, so you never know. Uh, but yeah, uh, Death by Futre and the Card Slinger, thank you very much for your comments. And if any of you uh, have anything to say about this episode, make sure to comment in the uh, comments down below and uh, let us know what you think about anything that we've talked about. We'll shout you out here and we'll discuss what you have to say. Heck yeah. Uh, but without any further ado, let's get into our top five enchantments in each color. Now, you may notice that we have been doing top tens. Um, I purposely limited this to top five because I didn't think there was enough there that was good. And in my experience of picking this list, I kind of felt that that was true because I felt like I was reaching a little bit in some of the colors. But then once me and Kirk sat down and actually compared our lists, uh, most of them were pretty close. And some of the things I thought that he wouldn't have picked, he did. So who knows? We're either super in tune with each other already or there's really only that many that are good. He said he had a lot of uh, uh, honorable mentions. I didn't pick any honorable mentions, so we may touch on those at the end of each of these categories. But uh, we also initially intended on having uh, color uh, artifacts with colored pips um, and do a top five for those as well. So we still get the pseudo 10, but it's uh, slightly different categories. Uh, but I had a, I had a lot of trouble with that. Uh, there's like two that I play in CDH decks. Uh, that's Wishclaw Talisman and uh, Imposter Mech. Uh, and that's about it. I mean, I play them in other decks that are casual or like Popper or whatever, but uh, we, we've brought up Portable Hole. Like, yeah, sure, that's good, but it's not getting played in every deck. So, I mean, I don't know. There wasn't really enough there, so we just decided to stick to the top five, and we're just going to roll with it. So, um, Kirk, you want to start off with uh, White? Yeah, absolutely. And I will, uh, again, reiterate, these are in no particular order. Um, Depending on the deck list, some of these are going to be better than others. So uh, so we'll start off with uh, White, because Wooberg. Islaine and I both agreed, Smothering Tithe. Now, we also both agreed that not all of these will make every deck. Um, oh, also, a quick caveat, we're just doing strictly enchantments. If it's an enchantment creature like Heliod, we're not including him on this list, since we might have covered those in Creatures. We could have, but we just decided not to include creatures. So, anyway, back to the list. Smothering Tithe, again, great card. It's one white and three enchantment. Whenever an opponent draws a card, that player may pay two colorless or two mana. If the player doesn't, you create a treasure token. Straightforward, creates a crap ton of mana. This is a card I have a love-hate relationship with. I end up cutting it half the time and then regretting it, but super powerful card. I agree. Um, when it first got printed, it was in every single one of my whitelists, bar none, because it was the best source of ramp that white's ever gotten outside of land tax, which isn't ramp, it's just thinning your deck. It's putting the shit in your hand, and most of the time you end up dumping most of those cards into your graveyard. So, Only not, if you're playing great. it correctly. Oh, total sidebar on that one. For the love of God, if you're playing land tax and you're given the opportunity to search, get three lands. If you have to discard a couple lands, who gives a shit? Right. Anyway, I don't. That uh, do you, you run into people that actually pull less than three? I see it on like I won't name names, but I see it on big channels that show CDH ga- or EDH gameplay, and they're like, "I'm just gonna get one." Oh my god, it drives me batshit yeah, crazy. I mean, the whole fucking point is that you're running a ton of basics and you're thinning your deck, and you probably only <laughs> need like five of them, and you're probably running rocks on top of that. And, you know. Oh my god, it drives me absolutely fucking nuts. Well, Unless you have so, some really crazy specific reason for doing it, get three. Dump them in the yard. Who gives a shit? I mean, at worst case, if you're really worried about it, just fucking play um, Crucible and be done. Then you can get I, them back. Dude, it... it, it it drives me fucking nuts. It's one of my biggest pet peeves in all of Magic, and it just... I see it... Uh, anyway. Sorry. Side note. Anyway. All right, so... Uh, on. Well, <laughs> hold. One, one last thought about this. So, Smothering Tide, very good when it first got p- printed. Uh, being four mana, that's where most CB, CEDH players say they draw the line unless it's super powerful. Now, in this case, I think it is worth the four. It would be great if it was three. Like, we'd still be running it at every single oh my thing. God, but be dumb. at four, you have to be a little more considerate, especially if you're running Adnaz and other things. you got to cut where you can. Um, you also have to keep in mind that if you are running into a lot of dock sides, this could be feeding the shit out of it. Great thing is, is that you are able to just sack the color, sack the treasures. So you can get out of that. But if you played that for four mana and you've been banking treasures to get your six mana commander out, let's say. 
and you know the dock side comes down and you get to sack those and then you got to wait more turns like eh, that just sucks so it is something to worry about but if you are in um you know like say you're in a jess guy list you could also be running pretty much every wheel there is to offer and benefiting off the smothering tithe. So, oh yeah, that's an option. I don't. We, we've already been clear that we're not really great on wheels, and we still don't know that even Orcish Bowmasters bring wheels back. But I, I, I have heard about Opus Thief making a return, so wheels may be back on the menu, and that may make smothering tithe uh, not to include again. We'll see. Yep, and even I mean, even just going around the table, if you end up getting two treasures net every turn, it is pretty busted. But yeah, as Liz Lane said, four mana is a lot, so. Uh, also, I guess, last thing, notably, them having to pay the tax to make you avoid it, uh, or to avoid you getting the extra treasure, is actually a pretty stiff cost. Like, you know, Thalia's it's and all those great. other things are one, it's two. So, like, if you're responsible and you're constantly paying the two, like, you're putting yourself back a lot. So, it's not that I'm saying don't pay the two, but probably don't pay the two. Totally dependent, but I hear you. <laughs> All right, moving on. Next on the list, these we lump together. Now, we understand they're different cards. They have a different corner case scenario, blah, blah, blah. But they do essentially the same kind of thing. And we've got Rule of Law and Deafening Silence. Rule of Law, one white and two colorless enchantment. You can cast one spell per turn. It's Deafening the OG. Silence. Yeah, it's the original. It's, the, it's not the extra crispy, right? The Deafening Silence, one white enchantment. Each player can't cast more than one non-creature spell each turn. A similar effect. I mean, it's great. They're both. It's it's scarier because it can come down on turn one. It's less scary because it can't stop. That's his Oracle Demonic Consultation. When creature based Ooh. strategies kind of became sort of the forefront, uh, deafening silence became less good. Uh, when it was first printed, you slam that down turn one. Nobody was doing shit for turns unless they had removal. Um, nowadays, like that, you slam that, and sometimes it's like. The Hullen or whatever is like, hey, yeah, I just slam all these yeah. fucking creatures oh, and oh, I don't give a shit. Why did Suck it, yeah. Right. So it, it, still it stops a lot of the Turbo Nas type stuff. So that's although, it's still a great card. Yeah, I mean, and also if you're on a creature based strategy, you can play it to stop everybody else's interaction while you do your thing. So in Hulk decks, it's pretty fucking good. Right. Yep. Yeah. And and for one white mana, you're not really expending too much of your resources. Mm-hmm. It's still a, a super strong card. I think Deafening Silence. I play in more decks than Rule of Law. Um, That's just me. Generally, I'm me. probably on both, uh, unless again, creature based deck like my mince list, it's on deafening and not rule. But um, most of my other decks that are on rule of law are running like all that they can. Yeah, I mean, there's so many with you know Eidolon and all the blah blah blah. Anyway, a lot of rule of law effects exist. They're all similar. They're all very powerful in the right scenario. Although I'm seeing less and less like stacks decks lately. I've seen more and more. Either turbo or mid range, and stacks are the, not as scary. The creature Weird. based decks and all the creature based combos that have been coming out in the last couple years, like it was basically, I don't know, it, it was basically like Flash Hulk, and then that got banned, and then there was everybody was on Adnaz for like Adnaz six months, and then everybody was on stacks to counter the Adnaz, and then mid range came back to counter the stacks, and we're just kind of in this cyclical thing. But you can still play any of those archetypes, and you're going to be fine. So. Absolutely. Uh, this one is my favorite card on on the white list, and I probably I don't know if it's yours or not, but it's definitely mine. And that's blind obedience. I'm gonna pull it up so I don't screw it up because I just called it out as my favorite, and I don't want to get it wrong. <laughs> one white and one enchantment. Artifacts and creatures your opponents enter the battlefield tapped. It also has extort. Extort's a weird one. It's one white or black mana. Whenever you cast a spell, you can pay a white or black. If you do, each opponent loses a life. You gain that much life. It's weird in that it has the white or black as the the cost, but it's not a color identity. So you can play this in a mono white deck. It's hybrid, and the way hybrid mana costs work is that if they're on the top, they're part of color identity, but if they're in the text, it's reminder text, so it doesn't matter. So you can yeah, play it dumb. in a mono white deck just fine. Any of the extort <laughs> cards, which they're all Orzhov, so... And I Outside of the ones love... that cost Orzhov off the top. Yeah. Anyways. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I freaking love this card. It's one of the best tools against uh, Dockside decks. If your treasures are coming in tap, they're not treasure storming off. Great Creature against based combos. Yeah, anything that relies yeah, on I mean, combat. So it kills pulls your opponents down. Mana Vaults fucking hate seeing this card. I mean, this card's just great. I absolutely love this. There's, there's multiple decks where I have where I'm running like Bomberman and Lion's Eye Diamond, and this is my win con. I just create yep. infinite mana, then I extort them to death. So yeah, that's what I was gonna say. Is that like it, and having, if it didn't have extort, then it's a middling card, and it's only in like 
you know, some stacks decks. It, it does the thing, but honestly, um, um, the sensor. Uh, it's Frixian a sensor. sensor? It? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It has that other piece where, like, the stuff comes in tapped, and honestly, people would probably just run that over, over blind if it didn't have Extort. I think Extort mm -hmm. makes a big deal just because it is that incidental life gain and drain, but, like, it's a win gun in itself. So. Well, in this one, just uh, the friction sensor, it's the rule of law plus creatures coming to play tap. This one being artifacts and creatures. Yeah, the artifacts makes a difference. Oh, too, good. Sure. So good. But it's not it just, as good. I would argue that it's not as good as one of the cards that I'm going to tell you about. And then it's also, you know, maybe not as good as like an oof because it's just, it's situational in the sense of like, they still get the thing, they can still use it. It's just, it slows them down a turn. Whereas the other stuff just turns it off completely. But I digress. Yeah, but oof doesn't stop Kiki Jiki. Yeah, uh, and that's why you play Celezi and you have the best of both worlds. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> okay, so the, those are the only three we agreed on. Yeah. Uh, moving on, the, the, do you want to go your two or you want me to do my two first? I, I can do my two to break it up here. Um, so yeah. I picked uh, Rest in Peace and Stony Silence, which, as I alluded to, it's the Collector Oof, but the Enchantment version. Uh, Stony Silence is like, uh, you're going to have to read them off because I don't have them pulled up, but I believe it's a, a white and one two. White and one. It's oh, one it's white, white and one. White and one. Okay. Yep. Activated then, abilities of artifacts can't be activated. So collector roof at that point. Um, rest in peace is basically the best same cost one white and one base best graveyard hate that exists in the format. Um, it comes Pretty down. Much. It exiles all graveyards, and then anything that would go to a grave gets exiled. So Ooh, I, I take it back. Dothy Voidwalker is the best graveyard hate because it sure. it doesn't hit yours, but this one's probably right there with it. As it, it oh, two. so yeah, it was the best until Dothy, but yeah, um, it's still the uh, original thing that just like blows people the fuck out. If they're on a graveyard strategy, they're just done until this thing gets removed. Absolutely. Uh, sort of like how Draneth is with you know commanders or like exile card casts and whatnot. So. Um, yep, notably between the, this between one, the two of them, like I don't know. I think that they're very good. Uh, I only play Stony Silence in one list, admittedly. I'm only playing Rest and Peace in a couple lists because most of the time you are trying to use your own graveyard, so it is tough. You have to build around it. Uh, Stony Silence, same thing. You're probably not wanting to play a ton of artifacts because you're shutting them down. You will play some, you know, maybe some of your early game zero drop rocks and stuff, but outside of that, you're probably not. So. Yeah, unless you're playing other, like, Null Rod, the other version of it. Right. Uh, Rest in Peace is notably really good because it also has the ETB clause of when it enters the battlefield, exile all cards from all graveyards. So that's pretty huge. A lot of your cards, like Dothy Voidwalker, when it comes down, anything future hit in the graveyard is gone, but it doesn't exile the existing stuff. So this one can be an answer to already exiled already exiled graves, and it does the thing there. Yeah, it'll hit um, your, your brood lords or whatever else Some the reanimator player was trying to sneak out. Yeah. They got a, an early entomb in there and got all sneaky with it. Well, or mm, later game, well. even um, admittedly, like you know, breach players have stacked their graveyard and they're just waiting for that last thing or the right time to pop off, and now their graveyard's gone. Or yeah. if you could somehow, like, with maybe with the uh, the Gandalf, oh, no, the Gandalf won't do it. He can't flash it in. Never mind. But uh, emergent zone or whatever, you just do that, flash that in in response to their breach. And now it's gone. Yeah, that'd feel <laughs> real bad. Yeah. I mean, it'd feel good, but it'd feel bad. Uh, so what All were right, the ones are, that you uh, that you picked? Mine are one that is a, is a format staple. Yeah, right. This one you see occasionally. It's humility. Two white and two enchantment. All creatures lose all abilities and have base power and toughness of one one. Uh, I've, I've definitely seen it. Uh, the only two lists I've seen it in is Shorkai and... Uh, Tevish Ishai. Uh, the Tevish Ishai I saw when I was in the MLC last year, and um, I played against it. It was a, it was a weird deck, but it, it does a thing. And Shorakai, I've seen it too. Um, I play Shorakai, but I, I chose to go more Isa Rev and Staxi and some vehicle stuff. Like, it's it's different, but um, yeah, I mean, I, it, I like it does it a thing. Bit. I have it in my Shorakai list just because if you're making 1 1 pilots, you're making 1 1 pilots, right? And uh, losing the abilities is also really huge as they print more and more and better and better creatures with broken ass abilities. It's kind of nice. Uh, the Ishai one, I've not played against it. I mean, if Tevish is is doing the whole thing and making one ones instead of zero ones, that's pretty solid. No, uh, not, yeah. not a bad little value there. And yeah, just being a giant, disgusting stacks piece that says creatures will not be a part of this this game and this win con strategy. Pretty gross. Um, mm -hmm. Four mana is a lot, again, as we've touched on, which is why you don't see it often. Plus, I mean, as creatures get better and better, it's 
Kind of like, why would you not want to run good creatures instead of just turning off all creatures? So, there you have it. Uh, um, I think the reason it, it was in Shorkai is because Shorkai's not a creature, unless you crew yeah. him. So it never affected your commander. You can do your thing, and that's why it's really good in that deck. In the uh, Tevish one, I feel like it's less good, but it's still a thing. Uh, the other card, and this one I think, I'll argue until I'm... Anyway, Swift Reconfiguration. One white, enchantment aura with flash, enchanted or enchant creature or vehicle. I always forget you can enchant a vehicle with this. Uh, enchanted permanent is a vehicle artifact with crew five, and it loses all other card types. So the corner case that most people don't think about is this is a pretty solid piece of removal. What you yeah. see this you typically use on is is the I can't think of it. In, uh, not an incubation druid. What's the damn druid? Uh, so zero devo devoted green, yeah. druid. Devoted so like druid. I uh, as soon as this came out, I I, I call it the swift druid combo. Um, yep. I run it in um, Sithis. And that's about it. And I like it because in that particular deck, I get a cantrip off of it as well. So I draw a card, and then I get my infinite mana, and then usually can you know do some shenanigans to win the game. Um, it can just make you infinite mana. So if you're in those colors, it's infinite mana regardless. So that's great. Yeah, but it's infinite, infinite green mana specifically. So unless you're in a deck where like you're running Finale of Devastation or something where you care about green mana, like... And see, and I, I run this in, like, my Akiri Thrasios deck because Thrasios don't give a shit if it's colored mana or colorless. Yeah, anything that's a colorless outlet, this is perfect, uh, and it will make you... You know, there's dumb shit, like, there's a... There's commons that are, like, X Convoker or Invoker or whatever, and it's, like, pay eight mana, deal five damage to everybody, and you just pay into this and you kill them. Yeah, you know, like, no big deal. Yep. So, uh, that's cool, I... I didn't put this on the like I run it in Sithis. It's it's a great card. It does the thing that you want it to do. It does also removal, uh, potentially, but I've never used it in that way. I always hold on to it for the combo. Oh, um, man, I, I flashed this in and uh, paid the ward cost and enchanted a Tivit just the other night and that was the end of Tivit for that game. So, I mean, that's cool. Pretty good. And, and yeah, I'm not saying that that's not a not, not a good option. Um I just didn't include it because I feel like it's pretty niche. I don't think you're really playing it unless you have the duel. Uh, reason to play it this in a deck that isn't green i don't feel like you run it probably needs to be not currently. white green yeah. x you know from there um humility yeah, i agree that uh, it's a good stacks piece it does the thing um i would argue that either one of my picks is better than swift uh humility could go in in just the same as like stony silence uh, if it was oh, me sweet. i would say probably rest in peace and then humility and see and for me i would probably put of the four i would put humility at the bottom of the pile I would put Swift Reconfiguration for me at the top of the pile and Rest in Peace and Stony Silence right in the middle of the two. See, I I appreciate the modality of it. We've talked about over and over that we love modality, but I just, I don't put this in over other removal. I'd rather run March. I would rather run... Uh, Absolutely, but you're not running it specifically as a removal. It just it has that mode available in, you know, in a pinch. Sure, but then again, as I said, like... You're probably on bare minimum Selesnia, and otherwise, sure. what are you in Bant? Like, what Bant commanders are getting played right now? No, I mean, I'm sure Derevi sees play. There's a few, but I yeah, mean, I sure. Well, then that's where I'm saying, like, it's kind of edge case in that regard, and that's why I didn't include it. I would argue and, you know, that I've seen humility this like is color. also is also fucking very niche. Um, I right, think you're probably right. seeing rest in peace and more than any of these. Stony Silence is on the edge of that. Like, it's probably not seeing too much play. And I think it's it's ironically should see more play than it does, weirdly, because yeah, artifacts and treasures are friggin' everywhere. And yeah. you see Null Rod, and it can be such a broken piece. You see Collector Roof, and it can be disgusting. Why I, th I, get I think a lot of people... Move, yeah, you know? I think a lot of people just run Null Rod over this, but agreed. Uh, I think this is harder to remove than a Null Rod, so... Yeah, and it, I think it, it is still feeding Dockside either way, but... Yeah. And see, and I can't, I can't tell you the last time I've seen a Rest in Peace in play. Honestly, uh, I, I play it pretty regularly, so I don't know. <laughs> you and your your angels and your white deck, darn you. Mm. Um, see, and I've run into Swift Reconfiguration Druid combos in Thrasios decks and Kenrith decks. I've seen it in. Yeah. All right, so, so uh, I, I will concede that we'll, we'll give you Swift. Now, which one are you? Which one are you going to give me? Whichever you prefer, man. I think both are very strong. I think Stony Silence is the stronger card that should see more play, but I could say that Rest in Peace maybe sees more play. So I'll let you pick on that one. I will just take what you said. Stony Silence it is. Cool. Yeah, play more Stony Silence, people. Card's busted. 
the problem with that in the white stacks decks is like they all a lot so many of them want to win with walking plus then you're like son of a bitch what are you doing but well i run it in sithis which does run that combo but i'm running like three other you know two card combos that can get you there so it's just you you pivot if you need that to slow down the guy who's urza who needs all of his artifacts it's worth your time to just pivot into the the uh, Siona and Shielded by Faith combo. Like, that doesn't yep. require anything. So And treasures, clearly. I mean, they printed more treasure cards in Lord of the Rings, so they're just here to stay. So, yeah. And foods, silence. foods, too. Like, yeah. that. And they've actually got some outlets now, too, because of the Lord of the Rings set. So, I think Stony Silence may need to see a little bit of a resurgence. So, we're going to put it there. Yeah, so moving on to blue. Uh, so we agreed on two out of the five, which surprisingly... Shocking, I mean, no one will be able to guess these, right? I mean, if you've been playing CDH for any amount of time, you should already know what the top two are. Uh, but, you know, out of everything that we've done, this is the one that we, we disagreed on the most. So uh, let's get into it. So top two, Mystic Remora, Ristic Study. That's fucking obvious if you have... I mean, even a casual, I think, at least Ristic Study is still being played Absolutely. all the time. So Absolutely. So, Mystic Remora's one mana. It's an enchantment. It has a cumulative upkeep of one mana, so you have to pay a mana each turn cumulatively. So, like, the first turn after you've played it on your upkeep, you have to pay one to keep it around. The next turn, two. And then three, and so on and so forth. Um, and it says that if anybody casts a non-creature spell, they have to pay four mana, or you get to draw a card. It's busted. It does cost you some mana, but I've seen people play this until they've paid six mana, and they've drawn, like, 20 something cards off of it and that's ridiculous but it, it happens um yep. there's most of the time people are a little more responsible they'll not play something for a turn a go around or they'll only play like one thing here or there so the guy draws two three cards and then says fuck it it's not worth paying for anymore and it goes away that's how i play it i usually if once i've gotten two three cards off of it i'm usually happy and i'll let it go um but you know, there are those people out there that are like on Thrasios decks that are just like, I'm just going to sit here and draw cards. You know, so. Ever goes away. <laughs> or they have Luris, and that's the worst case. It's like, Luris, oh, uh, just let it die. Yeah. Recast it. Mm. Suck. And this uh, is one where I, I've, I've also, uh, there's an interesting debate that's out there that I don't know if you've seen. People are talking about the the old, for years and years, it was turn one, Mystic or more, just slam it. If you've got it, slam it. Because there's so many free rocks, etc. And you're effectively either drawing shit of cards or slowing the opponents down, right? Right. I've seen some school of thought thinking you don't slam at turn one. You develop your board with your own mana rock or whatever the hell you're doing. And then maybe cast it on turn two or turn three so you can keep it around longer. And I don't know. I don't know which camp I fall in. I'm probably the idiot that's turn one in this son of a bitch. But I'm, I'm I don't know. Maybe I'm leaning more turns, turn, turn one, two. But, like, there's also a debate as to whether or not you cast your own into somebody else's. Because it then pressures them as well. But then it pressures everybody else doubly. So it kind of depends. So I'm of the school of thought that, like, let's say, so you're, you're like, turn... Uh, you're seat four, and, and seat one, turn one, plays Mystic Grimorda. And then the next guy goes, well, I'm not going to fucking feed him. The next guy goes, I'm not going to fucking feed him. And you go, land Mystic Grimorda. He's going to draw a card, yes. But then now, his turn is limited by you. I think that kind of makes sense to play it. It does fuck the other two guys because they already were responsible and now they have to be double responsible or they have to feed two players. But in that case, you're now getting fuel for the other guys so maybe you can deal with them. I think that that's okay, but there's also that school of thought where it's like, just wait until his dies and then play yours, but then maybe you're sitting on it for three or four turns and then it's kind of useless because people have mana. I don't know. It, it's kind of There's a lot of different ways that you can look at this card and evaluate it and play it, but I don't think that there's really a correct answer. Everything is lots of variables. So, absolutely. But and this it, is definitely the, one of the most taxing of the taxes because it's four mana. Yeah, nobody pays for it. Very rarely. Yeah. It's it's <laughs> like rarely. It, it's as rare as like somebody hard casting a force will. Like it doesn't happen. Yeah, it, but it yeah, does. I would, say, happen. I would say even rare. I'd say it's even rare. You know, the the time I see somebody pay for this is when they've slammed their swift reconfiguration on their stupid druid, and now they have infinite mana. That's the only fucking time. <laughs> Uh, and then Ristic Study is kind of the same argument. It's two colorless and a blue, but it's any non-creature spell, one mana. But it doesn't go away. There's no cumulative upkeep. So if a Ristic Study land, like people will use Force of Wills, packs, all any free counter spells that they have on Ristic Studies because 
they will sit around the entire game unless there's somebody that has removal. And sometimes that just doesn't happen. So, like, you have to play to your outs. So you start playing shit, trying to combo. And they're like, you want to pay one? And you're like, no. And they draw. And, like, you have an Adnaz turn. They've drawn 20 cards with you kind of thing. You probably shouldn't cast an Adnaz into this. But I'm just saying, maybe you do and you get the removal and then whatever. But they've already drawn a bunch of cards, too. So they have the counter spell. Now you have a counter war. You fuck yourself. And the next guy wins. Yeah, you so, better have your uh, Grand Abolisher in, in play already or your jam right. your silence first, At that right? point, oh, you're, yeah. you're golden. No worries. Yeah. But prior to that, yeah, yeah you're kind of fucked. And notably on both Mystic and Rhystic, it is a May draw ability clause, which is really nice. You can't accidentally screw yourself. You, and you can kill and yourself with yeah. Ledger Shredders and uh, Archivist other, Logmos, other cards especially. that are yep. not Mays. Yeah, Even so. Esper Sentinel, I think, is not a May. No, anyway. Esper's not. No. Yeah. yeah. So... Um, those are the two that we agreed on. Uh, basically the same card, a little bit different case you know, studies that can be done on them, but they are probably the best card draw advantage engines in the entire game and probably will be forever because I don't see anybody... I, I mean, as much as Power Creep's a thing, I don't see them printing anything that's as good as these. Oh, let's hope not. I mean, they I keep mean, trying to get the They're trying the with of white, they but they're not... Like, wrist, like it was called Ristic Buddy or whatever, or Fish Stick... Uh, the Esper Sentinel is the closest thing to it. It is the same effect, but it's only it only happens once a turn, and that's right. where it's fixed. And they may print more things like that that you know once a turn or whenever somebody does an action two times, you know, blah blah blah. So we've already got that in 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 droves as well. But. They seem to be in love with both of those those uh, formatting of their cards going forward. But yeah, these are both format defining cards, hundred percent. Yeah, uh, and. You know, for the PDH players out there, there's a reason these are the only two cards that are banned in the format because they're commons and it, no other color has anything at this level at common. Period. So it, it was just you, you would always play blue and you would always win. It, you mulligan for these, you tutor for these, and it's just the, the game's over. So it'd be gross. Um, so we didn't agree on three different things, and um, honestly, the cards that I picked and the cards that Kirk picked. I feel are all even, and I don't even know how... I mean, actually, there's like two of mine that are probably less better than yours, but I, I had a hard time picking them here because those two that we already talked about are what I play in most of my decks that have blue. These other ones are all very situational, um, but they're all very good. So the ones I picked were Counterbalance, which is two blue. Uh, whenever somebody casts a... is it not, It's not a creature, isn't it? Let's cast the spell. It's just cast? Anything, yep. All right, so anytime anybody casts anything, I have the option to flip the top card of my library, and if the CMC equals the CMC of the card that they cast, or mana value, uh, it gets countered. But the, the problem with the, the, the obvious weakness here is that player one casts a one CMC spell, I flip, I have a land, so it's zero. So I can only counter zero costs. And then the whole rest of the table gets to do whatever the fuck they want because they know I don't have it. But I've also had it where I revealed a two and then countered somebody's thing and then the very next guy goes and casts another two drop and then I counter it again. So like sometimes it's just, it's even though it's known information, like people just forget. So it's a very good card, but it's only good in decks where you're trying to control and or stacks and try to slow the game down. If you're in a turbo deck, you don't play this. So, yeah, it's also interesting that uh, as they print cards like a ledger shredder, etc., where you sometimes draw cards mid turns and stuff, where the top deck will change. Maybe this is getting better because you're like yeah, you said, you're notably. not getting that revealed information to player the next player in turn order. And the next two know that they're clear to go. I mean, right. Also, you, you could changes, have yeah. you could also have a fetch land on your board and just not use it, and then in between. You know, you just you drop it and you pass turn, and then the next guy goes, and the next guy goes, and then you you reveal, and then you can shuffle and reveal again later. So yeah, and that's uh, I mean that's even aside from the old uh, you know the sensei's tops and the brainstorms of the world where you right. can set your top deck. Mm -hmm. Funniest shit I ever saw with counterbalance was playing a buddy of mine had his Urza deck. Another player jams their peer into the abyss. He fucking reveals a stupid seven blue mana. What are the bounce crake? And I can't think of the other name right now. Hullbreaker horror. <laughs> Flipped wow. it blind, flipped the whole breaker horror. We're that's like, crazy. well, fuck me. I guess that, that's that. So it was great. Sometimes that's the way it goes. Oh my god, I um, laughed my ass off. I've seen it with counterbalance decks where I've gotten the flip, or with um, the dumb Kozilek that some people play. Even though it's not super CDH, I've still played it in CDH pods, and like, 
gotten that weird flip where you're like, really, you have a nine drop? Like, are you serious? Um, so next up, uh, was copy artifact. Uh, this is not one that I play that often. I literally just went through my own deck list to make these choices, uh, because I figured that's probably, you know, the most played, at least for me. So, um, I don't play it in a lot of decks, but I think it is a very strong ability. It's one in a blue, uh, it ETBs and you make a copy of any artifact on the board. So... Most of the time, it's a Soul Ring, or it's a Mana Crypt, or, you know, Mana Vault because you needed the extra mana, or whatever. So it usually comes down, and it just is a Mana Rock. But there are edge cases where it could be a, you know, uh, Isochron Scepter, or it could be a Wishclaw Talisman, or whatever. So it also could be an Esper Sentinel, because it doesn't specify that it has to be a non-creature artifact, I don't think. Nope, any artifact. So... Yeah, it, it, it's a it's a decent card. Um, is it better than some of the ones you have? Probably not. That's probably the one that's going to get cut. And I see. I used to see this played more when ISO Rev was bigger in the format because people would you know do the ISO Rev, do this Paradox with Swan Engine too. Yeah, and it, create infinite swans or whatever. And I saw this more often then. And yeah. like you said, it's it's definitely fallen out of favor. Still a very strong card though. Uh, last one was Arcane Laboratory, which is literally rule of law, color shifted to blue. We should just call, call it a, like blue blue rule of law. I got nothing. Blue just, of law. Just blue of law. Yeah. yeah. There you go. Um, that's literally all it is. Um, the reason I put it here is because there are some decks that I play that are Azorius and want every rule of law effect. Uh, strangely, though, as much as I liked Phyrexian Sensor, not good in most sto- in, in most uh, stacks decks because most stacks decks they're running the uh, Ethersworn Canonist, which will allow you to play extra artifacts. And then they're playing the uh, Deafening Silence, so they can still do creature shenanigans, and that's usually what you want. Uh, Phyrexian Sensor makes your own creatures come in tapped, so, like, not good. If it was not symmetrical, like, I don't think it would be as bad. No, it's not symmetrical, it'd be insanely busted, but... Right, so, like, it kind of is the only one that you don't run, but if you want that extra one in blue, or if you're just in a blue deck that is staxy like Urza, you could be running this to have your own rule of law. So, I've played um, Phyrexian Sensor in a few decks, but this one I, I specifically play. I have a five-color Stranger Things with Mike and Eleven that I play all the rule of law effects, and this is 100% in that deck. It's it's the only rule of law I can pitch to a Force the Will if I need to. So, I mean, there's that too. Um, it's not, again, it's not like the best thing in the world, and I, I am also willing to concede this to some of the ones that you have but uh i was looking through my list and these are the ones that i got to and i was like yeah those are good uh but actually looking at what you said i'm like eh, i probably play those in more more situations Ooh, yo, i might sway in my way arcane lab does have the uh, the downside of arcane laboratory of being hit by a pyroblast or red elemental blast which sucks but also are. all these blue cards can so yeah true um the ones i picked uh we'll, we'll start with curiosity and by extension even though it's not the same card, again, for all you purists, etc., Ophidia and I. Uh, Curiosity is one blue. It's an aura. When a, whenever Enchanted Creature deals damage to an opponent, you may draw a card. Ophidia and I is the exact same thing, except for it's one blue and two, and it has flash. So this card is busted in Div Mizzet decks, quite obviously, which is where I absolutely freaking love it. It's also quite good in anything where you can play Glenhorn Buccaneer, because if you can happen to draw up to eight and go to discard, or if you happen to activate him and discard a card and deal damage to your opponents, you draw on all those cards, move your end step, move to clean up, discard, wash, rinse, repeat, probably kill everybody. Yeah, I, I think uh, Niv Mizzet and probably Brawl and Shabraz are the only places where it's these are really truly played all the time. But uh, also, um, you know, Malcolm Kettis, anything that can yep. play, uh, like you said, Glenhorn Buccaneer, that that does the thing. Uh, so Vile Smasher and Malcolm is another deck I sometimes either play it in because sometimes people just jam this on Vile Smasher and then every time Vile Smasher does its thing, they're drawing free cards. So, not bad. Anything where you can attach it to something that's going to do damage to everybody. So, like, it can attach to uh, Reckless Fire Weaver oh, yeah. or any of the other thing. And that's a Malcolm Kettis thing where, like, you attach these kinds of things to... Uh, any of those that do damage around the table and then... Um, you could also attach it like Kedis himself, and I've done that where you just swing, <laughs> swing and draw yeah, three. That seems fine. Three, that's fine. And even if he doesn't live too long, you, you're still going to draw some cards. Um, yeah, yeah one it, blue if it replaces itself, and plus one, you're not doing. I mean, one blue draw two isn't the worst rate. That's for damn sure. Yeah. What else you got? 
Uh, next, I have, uh, again, this is one that's kind of a, a split, but it's similar as far as the, the effect. And that's Freed from the Real and Pemmin's Aura. And that's a whole other debate on which one you think is better. But anyway, Freed from the Real, the one blue... Shit. Honestly, <laughs> for the most part, for the most part, uh, Freed is one blue and two. It's an aura for one blue mana. Tap enchanted creature for one blue mana. Untap enchanted creature. Essentially, you're looking to enchant something that taps for one blue plus, you know, whether it's two blue, etc. You can create infinite mana. Uh, Pemmin's aura. It's two blue and one. It has the same blue untap blue tap. It also has one blue enchanted creature can't be the target of spells or abilities this turn. And it's got one colorless. Enchanted creature gets plus one, minus one, or minus one, plus one until end of turn. So this one has the added, like, the, the pseudo, not hexproof, but a, yeah, hexproof. Pseudo hexproof clause for a blue mana. It does cost two blue and one instead of one blue and two, so that's a pretty hefty difference. Anyway, very similar cards in as far as the effect. They're, they're essentially in a deck with something that taps for two mana to try and create infinite mana. Kinnon list can come up with if you have a Kinnon, a Birds of Paradise, and this boom, you have infinite mana of all colors. If you have uh, Zexara, I think is the the blue black green dude that taps for two mana of any color. Yep. Yeah, the Hydra, infinite mana. There's a bunch of them. I mean, Bloom Tender, blah uh, blah. These blah. are also uh, PDH combos. Oh, and the last one is Dress Down, and it's one blue and one. It's barely an enchantment, folks. It's almost an instant, but one blue and one enchantment with flash. When Dress Down enters the battlefield, draw a card. Creatures lose all abilities at the beginning of the end step. Sacrifice dress down. Uh, this is one I'm disappointed in myself for not thinking about because I love this card and I play it in several lists, but it's not an auto include. It's something where I feel like it probably should see more play, but it is, like you said, kind of just an instant. Um, it, it's good. It, Thassus comes oh, down, so you good. flash this in, you stop that. Uh, Dockside comes in, you flash this in, you stop that. Uh, it stops a lot of game winning combos, dual caster stuff, uh, combat Morning celebrant Brood stuff, Lord. like anything that. Oh my god! It, it stops basically every creature combo that exists. You just have to know when to play it, and you need to leave the mana up when you have it. Um, yep. And it it's replaces su- itself. It's, it's super good. I would put this in automatically over copy artifact. Um, I think I'm good with that. I one. think counterbalance deserves to be on the list. Uh, the other two, I'm willing to concede to your. At least two of yours. So if we're going, we're if, if we're just going on those, I'm going to say I'm okay with counterbalance on the list as long as dress downs on the list and curiosities on the list. How about uh, that? I'm happy with that. Perfect. Yep. I mean, I, I I'm <laughs> I'm that guy that loves Pemmenzor and Free from the Real more than most. I but love I it too, Pemmenzor but it. I also feel like you see the others more often. They're more playable in the sense of like you can put it on anything and it just draws you a card. Anything yeah, that can so deal good. combat damage deals you draws you a card, and with Affinity and I especially, like you can be in your Yuriko and you can attack with one thing and then Ninjutsu in Yuriko and then also flash in an Affinity and I on her so that you draw a card and then reveal a card and deal damage. Blah blah. blah. Like it's just cool. You can do a lot of fun shit with that. And a lot of goofy stuff within some free, speed. Free, for sure. free from the real is great, and Pemmins are they're great, but they're only great with like either pingers or green cards it it makes you infinite mana or it pings the table to death that's basically what it does most of the time and there's only certain decks that can do that so by that metric it it goes and dress down and like you said i think it's it's another one that's probably criminally underplayed i think it's it's just so good i've liked it i've liked it since it came out and i've played it quite a bit and it's it's impressed me it's 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 the problem is is that like when you start getting to certain levels of card card quality, it's really hard, and sometimes you got to make cuts that you maybe don't want to make, and sometimes that's the one. But yep, and it's another big one. Like I, there are so many times because it's at the beginning of the end step, sacrifice dress down. So somebody ends their turn, flash it in after they've begun their end step, untap, play your stuff because their Dranith Magistrate is no longer reads the I can't, right. and then it dies at the end of your turn, and there you go, Bob's your uncle. So I like this card. I hate this card and I like this card. It does not see enough play. It probably sees play more in like CDH tournaments than it does in like the casual CDH. Probably. Casual CDH. You know, the, the the local CDH medicine scenes, but give it a try. It should see more play than it does. You're up next for block. Oh boy, I get a mouthful of necropotence, because that's the first one we're gonna talk about. 
One, two, three black mana to play it. It's an enchantment. Skip your draw step. Very important. This is the one I see people forget all the freaking time. Skip your draw step. Whenever you discard a card, exile that card from your graveyard. So if you discard it, you don't discard into exile. You discard to your graveyard, then it exiles. Also relevant. Uh, pay one life. Exile the top card of your library face down. That means you don't know what it is. Put that card into your hand at the beginning of your next end step. So at the beginning of your end step, you put them in your hand. If you're above seven, you still have to discard, which will then go to your grave and then go to exile. Anyway, so many little nuances with this card that piss me off that people misplay and they miss opportunities to do things. It's another story. Uh, Mana Vault deals damage to you in your draw step, not in your upkeep. If you have Necropotence and Mana Vault, you don't take damage from Mana Vault. There's one little yep. tip for everybody that I see played in played incorrectly a lot. It's not an upkeep. It's an upkeep trigger to untap the mana vault, not the damage. Uh, anyway, this card, stupid good card. It, it actually is probably, for a while, it saw a shitload of play. It was everywhere. And then it kind of fell out of favor a little bit, I think. And I'm not sure where it's, where are you at on it right now? I play the hell uh, out of this. Is Lane, what about you? I It fell out of favor for me because I felt like I was always like, pay 30 life. And now I'm at 10. And I drew ass. And now I'm just dead. And that, it, it can happen with Adnaz, and it can happen with Peer, it can happen with anything. But I feel like every time I play Adnaz, it, obviously it's not every time. But I feel like I have a better percentage win rate with Adnaz or Peer than I do with Necro, so I started cutting Necro. Also, notably, with Necro, you have that chance where, like, it's gonna go to discard, and you can use shit like Yogg... Not Yogg's Will. Is it Yogg's Will? Oh, we have to have Shimmer Mirror, or, you know, that... Uh, Battle Thopter or whatever, but like you can do some shenanigans with Necro where like you go to discard, but because they hit the graveyard before they go to exile, unlike Rest in Peace, where they just instead go to exile, which is why Rest in Peace is a good card, but anyway, uh, there's a little window there where if you have Emergence Zone or anything else that gives you flash speed, you can use the cards that you discard at your end step beforehand. So if you're in red, you could also potentially do some, like, Final Fortune or whatever. Like, it's kind of a Nas Storm idea, but it's done through the graveyard with Yogg's Will or Breach uh, and a Flash Enabler to do blah, blah, blah. So, Like Born Upon the Wind from Lord of the Rings that we talked about? Yeah, yeah, that works as well. Um, the Shimmer Mirror, the uh, Gandalf sort of um yeah they, they all kind of do the thing and, and they can do the thing well um necro's fine i like necro so when i play necro i feel like the best way to play it is to get it out and i i used to use it a lot with zur because that's like where it really shines because you get zur out and then you tutor it on your first combat and then from there you can either turbo or dig deep but i just kind of like to just be like okay i'm at four cards in hand i'll i'll dig three and not have to discard anything, only lose a little bit of life, don't put yourself in lethal range, and just have it as a value piece. The problem is that you can't draw anything for free. Everything is going to cost you a, a life. And with Orcus Bowmasters and stuff, like that could also be... I think it's just put it in your hand. I don't think it's... Put it in your hand, not draw. Yep, yep, yep. So yep, you, put you're not, you don't have to worry about Bowmasters, but uh, it, it's fine. I, it, It's fine. I, I've seen people play it and win with it. I just... I always feel like I fuck up and play it wrong, so I just don't play it. And get too greedy, delve too deep <laughs> like those dwarves. Yeah. See, and I love, I mean, I absolutely love slamming this with a dark ritual on turn one and just watching your opponents just their face melt because they're like, <laughs> oh shit, well, this is going to be a really short game or he's going to screw up and kill himself and go, I'm going to pay 38 life or something ludicrous. Yeah, I'm with you. I'm probably in the first time it comes down, it's obviously game state dependent, but a lot of times I'll go 15, 20, 23 life, something in that neighborhood to make sure my next turn is going to be super impactful, if not a win. I love this card. I love it because I love Dark Ritual, because I'm a big weirdo, and that card's been around forever, and I've loved it forever. I used to love slamming Hypnotic Specters and all that stuff with Dark, with dark Ritual, so... Yeah. I recognize the power of it, and I yeah, recognize that it's on better list. people it's than me can play it well. I play it like shit, so I don't play it anymore, but it still deserves to be on the list. Fair enough. Uh, moving on, so this is one we we lumped these three together, and we'll talk a little bit about the differences in the corner cases of them. But uh, Anime Dead, Dance of the Dead, Necromancy. So Anime Dead and Dance of the Dead are both one black and one. Anime Dead has returned a creature from any graveyard to the battlefield with Anime Dead uh, enchanting it, and it gets minus one, minus zero. I'm probably paraphrasing, but that's essentially that's what it does. 
And then if animate dead is removed, the creature goes back to the grave. Yep. Whether it's balanced, destroyed, etc. Dan, so, Dance has a weird wording, but it's essentially the same thing without the neg one. Um, uh, yep, it's plus one, plus one. It, ETB's tapped. It doesn't untap unless you pay a black and one in your upkeep, I believe it is. Somewhere. So, it doesn't yeah, matter, it's, usually. <laughs> yeah, the cards you're getting back with this, it's usually irrelevant. Um, again, these are both just reanimate spells from the grave, so your your typical black shenanigans. Uh, Necromancy is one black and two. It's totally different because it becomes an aura. It's an enchantment that becomes an aura when it hits the battlefield. I think you still have to target with it when you cast it. I think that might have been errata, but the the main thing is it essentially has flash. But if you have if you flash it in, it sacrifices itself at the end of turn. Otherwise, it's literally the same fucking card. Yep. And where necromancy is a little, honestly, a little better right now in the format um, is it's it's (laughs) if you're going to get your protein hulk and you put it in the graveyard with like an entomb or whatever the heck the one black and one sorcery one is unmarked grave maybe i don't know Something either way like you put your you entomb your uh, your protein hulk and then you flash this in instant speed your hulk comes back end of turn you sack your hulk there's your your reanimate spell and your sack outlet right there you can also just get people if they're doing other shenanigans with this card but it's it's probably honestly even though it costs three the other costs two it's probably the best of these because of hulk right now in the format i don't know let us know your opinion um, you no know, that's a good question for the chat out there if you want to drop an opinion anime dead dance of the dead or necromancy what's your favorite of these three and why my favorite's anime dead it's basic it's the og and it uh it does the thing you want it to do without really affecting anything um, I do like Necromancy for the flash speed, but I don't think I've ever cast it for flash speed. I've always just done it main phase because <laughs> most of the strategies I use that require these cards, where I'm running all three of them, it's mainly entomb something and then reanimate it. I don't care when I do that, and most of the time I want to do that main phase when I have the ability to continue. Well, I guess Necromancy is good on an end step if it wasn't for the sack clause. But that's the problem. It's like I can flash it in and do the thing and end step, but by then I'm probably already tapped out and I've already done other things. I need it to happen on my main phase. It's the same principle I have with Adnos. Like, I don't play instant speed Adnos on somebody else's turn. I've never done that. Literally zero times. I am a main phase Adnos player because I want to win with Adnos. I don't want to whiff on somebody else's turn or get everything I need to win and then have to discard down because I can't do anything in instant speed. Like, no thank you. I'm, I'm I'm the the world's biggest Chad Nas player. I like end stepping it the turn before mine. So we're it is what it is there. I mean, if if we were literally just picking five cards and these had to each take their own spot, they would probably be in spots two, three, four for this black. Uh, yeah, I would easily cut most of the other cards on the list same. and just have these here. But I didn't I want like that because together. they are all doing the same sort of thing, and we can talk about more cards this way. Yeah, very functionally sim- similar. Similar. Next on our list, we're going to talk about the Meat Hook Massacre. Two Black and X. It's a legendary enchantment. I don't think I ever realized it was legendary until just now. How ridiculous is that? Only one Meat Hook Massacre at a time, folks. Uh, when the Meat Hook Massacre enters the battlefield, each creature gets minus X, minus X until end of turn. Whenever a creature you control dies, each opponent loses one life. Whenever a creature an opponent controls dies, you gain one life. So it's a board wipe stapled to an aristocrat payoff. Great card. Um, I included it because I do play it in a couple lists, and um, I like the fact that it's a board wipe with upside. And because it is an X thing, you know, you can kind of, it's modal in the sense that you can just be like, ah, I'm just going to kill all the mana dorks, so you don't have the advantage, but like, I'm not going to kill these other things because they're doing stuff for me, like, you know, a collector roof or whatever. Um, and then, or, or you can just go ham and fucking kill everything on the board, and then. As a result, you gain life. People lose life. So, you know, it does, it does a bunch just, of stuff. You can even just jam it out there as two black mana and have it be your aristocrat piece. You don't have to kill anything with it. Very good yeah. card. It has all of those options. Um, Let's see. Then we get to the ones where we're not 100% agreeing. And uh, I'll let you rock with yours first. Um, so this one I don't actually have in any CDH list. I run it mostly in CPDH, but I think that it's something that might be overlooked a bit, and it's Oubliette. Uh, it's two black and one, um, and its target creature phases out. So it's not even, it's not exile, it's not destroy. So indestructible and any other sort of effects outside of them 
um, you know, flickering their own creature. Like, there's really nothing that stops it. Uh, and then when, if, when you use this on somebody's commander, uh, it's not a thing where they have the option to... Because phasing isn't a changing of zones. The way phasing works is it's just treated like it's not there anymore. And the commander rules are that anytime your commander changes zones, you may choose to put it in the command zone anyway, and then you just have to pay the taxes to get it back out. Uh, in this case, it will remove that Dargo that's been beating your face in for three turns and is about to hit you for lethal. It will make him disappear. And unless they can... Dis and if they're mono-red, they can't. Um, if they're in black, they've got like two cards. And if they're in any other color, they may have some more options. But um, <laughs> yeah, there's, there's cards that cannot remove... Th there's colors that cannot remove this. So if this happens to hit your combo piece or your commander who is your combo piece or whatever the case this will stop you from doing anything for a long time possibly in the entire game i see the uh i see the rare wild magic surge out there in the wild but yeah sure. most of the time i mean yeah, that's chaos warp killing. too but yeah i mean it's it's pretty rare that you have the op right. option for this if you're in uh white or green you're probably okay but otherwise you're probably fucked so also, notably, don't target the wider green players because they probably got the answer for this and you're probably just wasting mana. Yeah, I think it's an overlooked uh, piece. I think kind of like Dress Down, it's a really good removal piece that can stop a lot of shit from happening. Oddly, being too black and one and the kind of decks that would play this, it probably just adds to their great merchant pips anyway, so they're happy about that. Weirdos. but <laughs> I, I, would run the, I run this in Crick, so like, yeah, it, it, does, it does a thing. And in CPDH, uh, it's one of the best removal spells in the game. If you're in black, you're probably playing this regardless. Yeah, notably, it's been reprinted. So the uh, the Arabian Nights versions are no longer like 30 bucks. Hey, I, I think that thing. may be, too, why it was overlooked quite a bit is that, you know, uh, there's also a lot of white cards that do kind of similar things. It's not phasing, but it's still effective removal for less, possibly. So maybe that's why it doesn't see as much play, because maybe it's probably only in like Orzov decks, but... I don't think it's bad. It's not necessarily one of the best, per se. It was just one of that I could think of. So, totally um, fair. My other one was also kind of a reach. It's Leyline of the Void. I play it in like approximately one CDH deck. It's not exactly the greatest thing ever, but it is um, basically rest in peace. Uh, and it does have that added caveat of being like Gemstone Caverns, where if it is in your opening hand, you can play it for free. I believe it costs four mana otherwise. Two black and two, yep. Yeah, so it's it's not aggressively costed, and you're probably playing it just for that, like, oh, I lucked into it, and now I get to exile everybody's graveyards, you know, um, and keep them in exile. Honestly, it's probably outclassed by Dothy Voidwalker. It is outclassed by Dothy Voidwalker, but uh, it was something I saw in, in, in a list that I play. So um, looking at your choices, yeah, I think that one can go. <laughs> So what 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 were the the couple that you picked? Oh boy, we'll start off with Chains of Mephistopheles. Um, I won't bore you with the card version of what it does. What it actually does, it's one black and one, an enchantment. If a player would draw a card except for the first one they draw in each of their draw steps, that player discards a card instead. If the player discards a card this way, they draw a card. So basically, you have to loot. You have to discard, and anything other than your first draw, discard, then draw. If a it's, player doesn't discard a card this way, fuck, they right? mill a card. <laughs> it, it looks a lot worse than it is. So basically, if it's your draw step, you ignore this. If it's not your draw step, if you're going to draw a card, you have to first discard a card before you draw. Discard. So if you're playing Brainstorm, it's discard a card, draw, discard a card, draw, discard a card, draw. It's horrible. And then put two back. So anyway, this sucks for Brainstorm players. But yeah, basically, that's it. If you're going to draw a card, you have to discard a card first to draw a card other than your draw step. If you can't you mill cards instead you just flat mill you don't get a draw it's great Gross card, if, you're on the, card. if you're on get rock monster it does work for you um otherwise it's pretty kind of a stacks piece for other people i fucking hate this card i don't play it anywhere but i recognize that it's powerful and that it should be played in the decks that can play with it so yeah i'm i'm willing to concede it's better than ley line like right off the bat um the yep. other card on my list uh, so Exquisite Blood, one black and four colorless. I always thought it was two black and three, so I'm glad I looked. One black and four. Whenever an opponent loses life, you gain that much life. 
So then again, like he's saying, there's so many like veto and other cards when you veto, gain, Dina, your opponent loses life. Yeah, there's a loop of win. So yeah, and yeah, this card is. You used to see it a lot more. You used to see it a lot more back in the day, but it, and then it kind of went away, and then it's starting to make a comeback with certain like the Dina, like you mentioned, sees this and and really do some crazy wins out of nowhere with this card. So um, I've also oh. put it in random like Golgari and or Jund lists where I'm just like, I'm going to run Vito and Dina and this and just like I can use green tutors to tutor up the creature and I can use black tutors to tutor up the other piece. It's super expensive, but like you're probably doing the Chain of Smog thing first with Witherbloom, but like this is another win con you can't have. When I was on Dina, I was running the Chain of Smog plus this plus Aserak and Aluren, mm -hmm. and all of those would win you the game. So you know, hey. Yeah, if you're on the Orzov list or something, there's I mean, Academy Rector exists, right? Yeah. You can just go get this and slam it in play. So mm -hmm. I don't know. It's one I put on the list. It's I don't know that it deserves it a spot or not. It doesn't see as but... much play as the others. I don't know that Oubliette is seeing any more play than Exquisite Blood, though. Honestly, I play Exquisite Blood in decks, whereas Oubliette, I'm not running in too many. So it's kind of a toss-up. Leyline, uh, Leyline is fine to go, and Chains we already put on the list. So it's really down to those two. I'll, I'll, I'll let you have this one. <laughs> I would say I, currently I play Exquisite Blood in, in like two decks, so I'll go with that one. We'll With it. the caveat saying, I might try Oubliette in a couple decks and see, like you said, I mean, sure, it only hits creatures, but there are certain decks that cannot cannot win or cannot function without their commander very well. So two black and one, get rid of a commander, get rid of a player, seems pretty okay. This was a, a hard one to really narrow down. We considered, like, Waste Knot. We considered, um, what's the one called? Call, Call of the Ring. Yeah. That one, I think, might end up making the list as I tested more because it actually has been testing pretty damn well, but... Cool. And honestly, like we said earlier, we could have just did Necropotence, the three animate dead effects, and Meat Hook and just been done. But we chose not to do that. So, here we are. Cool. Uh, so, moving on, we're up to red. Um, the most obvious, and honestly, I was surprised still, though, that we, we agreed on four out of five here. But the most obvious is Underworld Breach. That goes without saying. It's a one red, throw it on the field. You can play anything in your uh, graveyard by discarding three cards, or sorry, exiling three cards from your graveyard and then casting uh, the spell for its mana cost. Yep. Yeah, they all have escape of exile three cards basically from your graveyard, which is super important. You're not casting your fierce guardian chip for free from your graveyard because you have your commander in play. You still have to pay three, etc. Go on. You do. Um, it also affects things like um, you know anything that you're trying to do. Uh, you have to... So, like, the, one of the common combos with Underworld Breach is Brain Freeze. And in a lot of cases, you have to Brain Freeze yourself first a few times to get the critical mass of cards to be able to exile them to then Brain Freeze everybody else. A lot of people will just Brain, brain Freeze themselves for most of their library. Maybe not the whole thing, even though you're trying to win with Thassa's probably still. You maybe don't do the whole thing just in case somebody tries to force you into a draw. Uh, so that would kill you. So, you know, you leave a few cards there, but uh, then you start doing it to everybody else. And because at that point your storm count is so high, you will mill everybody else out before you're worried about it. So, yeah, I mean, um, Brain Freeze, Grinding Station, and Stitcher Supplier are probably the three most common that I see as yeah. like yeah. ways to generate a buttload of cards in your grave and get somewhere. So, yeah, obvious include cards all over our format, even a value Underworld Breach, just playing it and Recurring something important is pretty okay. Whatever the case, if you can cast an Underworld Breach to cast those two tutors to get your two-card combo, it's worth it. So, it doesn't have to be a huge Storm thing. It doesn't have to be uh, too crazy. And I've played in casual decks where, like, it's kind of almost a Mizzis' Mastery in the sense that, like, you've dumped all these cards. It's mid-game. It's, like, turn seven or eight. Uh, you got 20 cards in your grave, and... You cast this, and you just cast some stuff and get some value, and there you go. Uh, it's a great card. Uh, it has been a win con for a long time. Lots of decks are built around it, so it's... it's yeah, for a while, a lot of people considered it the best win con in our format of CDH, so... Um, it's the probably, arguably, the best red win con, but maybe not necessarily able to do it by itself. Uh, moving on, very versatile sacrifice outlet, it's Goblin Bombardment. 
Uh, so one in the red. Uh, sacrifice a creature and deal one damage to any target. That's really all there is to it. Um, it powers combos that have to do with like Ruthless Techomancer and, and Dark Side. Dark Side. And, you know, you, you can basically, you know, cast one, make a bunch of treasures, sack to make more treasures, sack to do damage, do a loop where you're just making treasures and whatever. If you have Mayhem Devil, Mayhem Devil is arguably better than Goblin Bombardment. Anyway, you get my point. Uh, it is a very versatile sack outlet, and it does work with a thousand different... You can do dual caster Twin Flame. You loop, went loop. off turn instant speed with that, yeah. Yeah, those aren't... They give haste, but like you can't attack uh, on somebody else's turn, but you can sack all of those creatures that you just made to the bombardment yep. to win. Free recurring sack outlet. I know we probably both played in our Minsk deck, decks, I'm guessing, because it's a free sack outlet for a Brody Hulk that's repeatable, so... Yep. Um, it's just generally good, and um, like Viseraseer or whatever is a very good, you know, one mana uh, sack outlet that doesn't really have any restrictions. Uh, you don't have to tap it or anything. You could just sack, but... Uh, it only scries. It doesn't do damage. There's not too many where you just freely sack and do damage, and this is one of them, and that's why it's here. Next one up, I was very surprised that I picked it and Kirk picked it, but it's Aggravated Assault. It's two and a red, and then it's three and two red to activate to take an extra combat. Untap um, all creatures and take an extra combat. Notably, if you're in green, that means you also now just untapped your mana dorks that could potentially tap to do other things at instant speed in combat also if you're running like grand warlord rada or that dragon or anything else that makes there's a green red one and there's a red one i believe that make uh mana during combat there's also uh neheb there's a lot of things that make mana during combat that will pay for this so that you can go infinite Yep, I know Ragged Dragon loves this card. Yeah, there, there's a lot of, like, I play it particularly in my Werewolves deck, which I hate that deck because there's so much fucking management of Night Day and all this other bullshit, which sucks because I love the Werewolves and I think they're all very cool and they're flavorful, but it's just such an aggravating mechanic that Aggravated Assault had to go in there so I could get out my aggression. And I hope you uh, like this alliteration, but... Yeah, it, it's basically the same idea as that, like, I put in some of those creatures so that I can swing with all these werewolves and then also make mana to just continually uh, do infinite mana combos. Um, you can do it in, um, what's the angel? Not Aurelia. Aurelia? Aurelia? Yeah, yeah, that's right. It's Aurelia. She's kind of expensive, but she's a stacks deck that can run this, that can do she already has that on her as well i believe but it's yep, this one's a really deck. funny one a really really funny one in a like reonia deck with dockside extortionist if you can make five treasures you can make infinite little dock sides to attack um with. it also works in like Nigila, like with uh repository druid's repository where that will make the mana based on you tapping to attack and then you can use the mana there to aggravate the assault and get an attack again and then with Nigila, you're making infinite uh, tokens so yeah it, it can be used in a lot of different ways doesn't it doesn't see a ton of play it's it's mostly a casual card but um next one is blood moon this is uh as was mentioned with blue like the back to basics it's kind of the same idea two and a red all non-basic lands or mountains most decks in cdh not playing any basics so this is basically turning all of their land base into red and if they're on anything but red, like they're just their whole mana base is just shut off outside of maybe some artifacts and whatever. So, mm -hmm. um, this used to be a super popular and powerful card, uh, especially with like Tim Natana with a blood pod, and it was like you know, uh, stacks pieces, blood moon to shut off everybody else, and then you use your own birthing pod to just combo into a Hulk line and win. So, yeah, um. It's not as popular now. Uh, I don't see it played a whole ton. But if you're in mono red, there's no reason why you can't play it because it doesn't fucking matter. You only need red mana. So um, even Grohl probably doesn't matter as much because you're still going to be able to make your green off of your mana dorks. Uh, outside of that, a little harder to play. If you're in like three, four, five color, you're probably not playing this unless you're a super dedicated stacks deck. But 
I see this in some random like blue moon list. I don't think we even talked about back to basics, by the way, but we we talked about it beforehand. But back to basics, one blue and two uh, non basic lands don't untap. Uh, this one, yeah, like you said, I, it sees less play than it used to because treasures exist. That's really what it comes down to. Treasures, treasures. Everybody's got their treasures. Dockside gives two craps about this card, so this sees less play. But it is still a very, a very, very strong stacks piece. There are certain decks where if this comes down early enough, if they don't draw their mana rocks, they're done. They're just they're out of the game. They can't do anything but spectate while you yeah. only kill the table. It's, Absolutely, it's mana rocks and or dorks really that can only get around back to bases or blood moon, and that's why yep. they're very strong and they have been played over the years throughout various formats and decks and whatnot. But um, they've kind of fallen Has- out of favor a bit because of the treasures for sure. And there's an argument between playing this versus playing Megas of the Moon or playing both. Enchantments feed Dockside, sure, but they're also harder to kill than creatures. So I'm probably leaning this. I think I probably run both if I'm really on this. Um, I know I play Magus in, like, Winota because it can get popped in for free and then fucks everybody. But um, I don't think I'm playing Blood Moon in that. So that may be the the edge case where it's, like, the creature-based thing is better because of XYZ. Um, sure. but yeah, I mean, I mean you, and even in Blood Pot, I guess you can pot away a Megas into a four drop, but you can't pot this away. So who knows? Sure. In, in that regard, I think I'd probably play both if I'm going to want this effect. I'd probably play both. If you're on Is It, you probably play this and Back to Basics, you know, because why not? Yeah. Uh, so we come down to our last pick. Uh, we did not agree on, uh, but I think we agree. Honestly, I, I, I would say these could both go in the fifth slot. I don't have the one you picked in too many decks i have the one i picked in more decks but i can see the reasoning for both of them either way uh we're at stranglehold is my pick it's three and a red it's an enchantment that says your opponents can't search libraries and they can't take extra turns the extra turns part is not as relevant now i think when it got printed it probably was more relevant there's still some extra turns decks running around but they're not super common so you're probably not stopping anybody with that. I think it's more important that, like, if you're in red, mono red or low red X decks, this is just, your, it's the best thing you have. It's the closest thing you have to an opposition agent or anything else like that. Uh, this was doing the opposition agent work before opposition agent existed. It doesn't have flash, so, like, you have to play it out. It might get countered. It's not terribly hard to remove, but, you know... It stops people from tutoring. And it's asymmetrical, which is great. So you can still tutor and nobody else can. If you're in mono red, you really only have, like, Imp Recruiter and uh, Gamble. But, you know, it is what it is. It still stops fetch lands. It stops all kinds of stuff. So it's a pet card of mine. I play it in a lot of decks with red. Uh, your mileage may vary. Your your pick, also not bad. And it's yeah, just play. With, uh, but I don't, I, don't, I don't play it in a lot of decks either, so... Yep, and I'm I'm an Impact Tremors fan. I like this card. I probably play it a lot more than I play Stranglehold. Again, I like both cards. Uh, this one's one red and one enchantment. Whenever a creature enters the battlefield under your control, Impact Tremors deals one damage to each opponent. Where I see this most commonly played is like Fergie with Grinning Ignis and this, and it's everyone's dead. Yep. Except for you. Yep. I'm I, a really, really, really funny interaction with this one that I see played occasionally is in like Boros decks. With like Ephemerate and Dualcaster Mage in this. So that's kind of fun. I have a written in Siri list that this is one of the main win cons with some some goofy crap with like the uh, I can't even think of it. The, the one white and one cat that has flash or there's like a Fleetfoot Panther. That's like the white green and one cat that has flash and you have to balance a creature. You can create infinite mana a lot of ways or just the lure and cast them all for free and kill people with this card. So um, Notably, too, it's it's common, so it can be slotted in pretty much everywhere in any format, so that's that's nice. Um, honestly, I, I have a hard time picking between the two. I think they both have homes. Um, I think they both see play. I think Impact Tremors probably sees more play if you're going to lump in, like, casual and everything else, like... Stranglehold is one of those unfun cards, but I think as such is powerful. Um, I have a hard time picking between the two. Um, I picked the last one, so this one's on you, Chief. Which one are you picking? Well, I'm going to go with my pet card, of course. I'm with me. All right, we got it. <laughs> Stranglehold for the win, but 
Impact Tremors also for the win. Uh, actually going to win you the game, whereas the other isn't. But, you know, here we are. Also, the Possibility Storm, I guess, honorable mention. Um, I don't like that card. Uh, it's uh, very card. terrible. Um, it's great if you can run Dranith Magistrate as well. Like It has a number of ways you can lock the table out. I did not name my channel uh, the Possibility Storm because I enjoy the card. I named it because I enjoy Storm, and it was the coolest sounding thing uh, that had Storm in the name. And there you go. So if you were wondering why I didn't pick the Possibility Storm, it's because it's fucking awful and nobody wants to play it. It's like Goblin Game. They have so many fucking stupid Chaos cards in, in red that I just fucking hate to play against that... Oh, dude, I love the card. I love the card completely. With all the weird new stacks pieces that have been printed, this card just got better and better. So. I mean, Boy, you're not wrong. here in this loves it. You're not wrong. I just fucking hate it. I just hate <laughs> it. I hate that level of chaos or that level of, like, being locked out completely. And I, that that reflects in, like, the stacks decks that I build because I don't, I don't build, like, actual prison decks or, like, stacks locks. I always just... Make it to where, like, you gotta jump through some hoops, but you're not gonna be ever shut off completely. And luckily, this one, the Possibility Storm, only affects cards you cast from your hand, so your commander's still fine to enter from the command zone. There you go, buddy. I mean, we sure. fix it for you. If that is the way that you win the game, sure. But, uh, yeah, generally, fuck that card. <laughs> <laughs> Fair moving, enough. moving on, green is our last category. Take it away. All right, well, no surprise to anyone. We both picked Sylvan, Sylvan Library. Um, this is one. If I don't look it up, I'll get the wording wrong. It's 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 one green and one. It's an enchantment, obviously. If I could type, it'd be uh, on better. Your, on your, it, it's got a weird interaction too, because it's like on your draw step, you draw your regular card first, and that goes into your hand, and then you have the choice of drawing two extra. But you basically can look at all of them and then choose if you want any of them. But you can also choose between the card that you drew the first time and it's fucking weird like basically it's like draw three cards if you're playing on a webcam too also please put your hand down draw three cards just pick look at that up. separately exactly. so we don't think you're cheating and then you look at those three cards and you go i want one of them and i pay no life i put the other two wherever the fuck i want on top of the library or i want two of them i'm gonna pay four life and put the other one on top or i want all of them and i'm gonna pay eight life and put all of them in my hand. And that's exactly. basically how it's played out, but it's also weird if you have shit like skip your draw step or any other things like double upkeeps. So there's a lot of weird interactions in Magic that can happen, but generally in CDH, that's what happens. So. Yeah, essentially that's exactly the beginning of your draw step. You may draw two additional cards. If you do, choose two cards in your hand, draw on this turn. For each of those cards, pay four life or put the card on top of your library. It's the official But notably, it is not yeah. like Brainstar where you can put any card back. It has to be Just out of those three. This, this is why turn. we encourage people to put your hand aside, draw three, and look at those and make your choice. Ironically, though, it is if you do, choose two, choose two cards in your hand drawn this turn. Which so is if you draw on your upkeep. If you draw on your upkeep with some weird shit, you can put some of those back, too. Well, sure. Nobody if you, gets if, this right, dude. It's hilarious. If, if you are in Simic, you could theoretically, with the Sylvan Library trigger on the stack, cast a brainstorm, draw those cards. You would still have to put some back, but then you would draw those two. God, that's confusing. It's a nightmare. Uh, <laughs> the case where I see this used and why it's relevant, it's a beginning of your draw step trigger. So you draw your first card. This triggers. You could respond to like a worldly tutor, then look for two more cards, pay four life, and keep the creature you tutored for, and sure. the other card yeah, comes back that's on top, a better example. Yeah. But I'm telling you, if you have a way to draw in your upkeep, and then do this, and then draw your three, and then put two cards back, you can really confuse your opponents. They'll be like, what the hell's going on? Draw on this turn. Anyway, love this card. It's a great card. Most people play it wrong. Most people understand, understand what this card does, but don't really understand how this card works, so... Anyway. And in general, most of those educations aren't going to happen. Most of the time, it's going to be exactly what I said. You're going to either pay four, you're going to either pay zero and have one card, you're going to pay four, you're going to have two cards, you're going to pay eight, and you're going to have three cards. And um, also, notably, hitting Sylvan Library players is just as good as hitting Adnos players. That's my point. Close, at least. And that is the thing, too, to think about it. Most of the time, when you see this card come down, if they're playing it, they're playing it aggressively, it's coming down early. And they're drawing three cards and paying eight life. That's usually how this goes. At least the and first 
couple, couple go rounds. That's yeah. usually what happens. So yeah, they pay absolutely. about sixteen life, and then they go. I'm at sixteen. I should probably stop. And then Especially they then they look. Creatures, yeah. But then it ends up being basically a, a top. They yeah. look at the top three every time. Yeah, granted, they're putting two back, so they're only seeing one extra card each turn. But like that initial little burst, like they got the sixteen. They've dug six cards. Like, don't, don't hesitate to hit this open library players, but if you are scared of somebody that's about to pop off with Adnaz, you should probably deal with their life total as well. Yep. Something to consider. And for the love of God, it, it, it is a May trigger. You don't have to sell, sell the library, so if your opponent has an Orcus Bowmaster, maybe think whether you really want to want to look at those two cards or not. That anyway. or any, like, a Fairy Mastermind, if you are yeah. drawing extra cards, they're going to draw extra cards, like, maybe just draw the one. Yep. Yeah. Uh, moving on. Uh, probably my favorite card on the green list. I don't know about yours, but it's Food Chain. One green, two colorless enchantment. Exile the creature you control. Add X mana of any one color, or X is one plus the exiles creature exiled creature's mana value. Bend this mana only to cast creature spells. There's the official wording on it. So essentially, most decks that are using this are playing either one of Squee, the blue Mist Hollow Griffin, or the three drop Eldrazi El- looking uh, creatures that let you cast them from exile. There's only the there's only mana. three, and those are the three. If you're in uh, colors that can support all three, you're running all three. Usually you're running two of these. It's the colorless one and either the green or the blue. I'm sorry, the red or the blue. There are creature combos that run this and don't run any of those cards. Uh, Titania is one because with Titania, Food Chain, and Command Beacon, I think it is, you can create sure, infinite fire sure, three. Yeah. No, th- there are edge cases, but generally. Yeah, I think yeah. Nadir is the other one that you can, with the little black guy that makes elves when he goes, you can make infinite mana. So you don't have to have one of those. But well, those are typically what you're going to see. If you see one, if you see Food Chain, expect probably Squee or um, one of the other two. Food Chain has traditionally been either like back in the day, it was Tazri, and then it was First Liver, and then it was Zukima Kazur. Well, I'm sorry, Prosh was early earlier than those two. So there was uh, Jund, and then there was Five Color, Five Color, and then there was Soltai, Soltai, Soltai. Soltai. Thank you. Um, and then there's been other like four and five got like omnaths and uh, uh, naya and, rocco and all yeah that yeah there, and... there's there's more of them now there, there's more options for food chain than probably any other single win con uh as far as commanders go uh my personal favorite was ukima kazur because ukima is a finisher in the command zone whereas every other one requires other shit to happen so with ukima kazur you could literally chain it packed for f- food chain and potentially exile one or both of your uh, <clears throat> cast from exile creatures at the same time and if they went into exile and you got to your food chain and you got to cast your food chain you just win the game because you do infinite loops to make infinite mana and then you bring Ukima in over and over that drains the table um, I will say I was also a massive Ukima because I still have the deck put together I love the cards that used to be my favorite food chain deck my new favorite food chain deck is is Atraxa Grand Unifier. Yeah, Atraxa has been putting up work, oh, it's and so it's it's also adding white to the equation, which is white's white's pretty fucking good. I think white is probably the like it's not the best color individually, maybe, but as far as like supporting any single your game plan, like it's it's all the silence effects, all the new draw effects, like. It's really fucking good if you're trying to do anything that requires multiple steps in a combo and you don't want to get interrupted. <laughs> it's super good. It's definitely come up quite a bit. White is definitely not the uh, punching bag it once was. So For sure. Well, that's Food Chain. Great card. And there's the old famous saying of Food Chain wins games, right? There yeah. you have it. Uh, moving on, we lumped these two together. Similar cards, again, not the same, we understand, but similar-ish. Similar enough, we're including them together. Wild Growth, One Green Mana, Enchant Land, Whenever Enchanted Land is tapped for mana, its controller adds an additional green mana to their mana pool. Simple enough, right? Yep. Uh, Utopia Sprawl is one green mana. Enchant a forest. When Utopia Sprawl, Sprawl enters the battlefield, choose a color. Whenever Enchanted Land is tapped for mana, you add an additional mana of whatever color you chose to your mana pool. These are simply the best uh, mana ramp enchantments that exist uh, because of the fact that they are only one green. So in one case, you're getting a uh, Land of War Elf, and in the other case, you're getting a Birds of Paradise. Now, granted, with the Land of War Elf, you can enchant any land, which is great. It can be dual land. It can be a fucking gemstone caverns. doesn't matter. You're going to get that extra green. 
Uh, in the case of Utopia Sprawl, unfortunately, you do have to target a forest, so in most cases, you're running all the dual land forests, plus you're running some basics or whatever, so it's not going to be an issue. Them, exactly. But there are there are time, there are those times where you're like, fuck, I drew this and I don't actually have a forest. That sucks. But when you do have the forest, it's a bird's paradise because now it it's, well, it's better than birds because it's tapping for uh, green and the additional color. Either way, they're both ramping you. They're both great turn one plays. Arguably better than actually mana dorks because mana dorks are harder or easier to remove, especially with bowmasters and things in the format now. Um, enchantments hard to remove. Most people aren't fucking with your lands. Like land destruction isn't much of a thing. Um, if you were on a deck where you're like running five or six of those effects and you're just like shitting them out and putting them all in one land, that would definitely incentivize somebody to blow up that land. And there are still some, I think, like Assassin's Trophy and stuff can still target a land. So you may say you can as well. Though. Yeah, I mean, you, you, you may fuck yourself in that regard, but most of the time, these are some of the most efficient ramp pieces that you can get. Yep. Ingrid. Also, Blood Moon can kill a Utopia Sprawl if you enchant it. We did it. We did our throwback to Blood Moon. Anyway, yeah, um, yeah Utopia Sprawl is really good. Uh, weird corner case scenario. You have a Shia in play. You can enchant one of your creatures with it. I've done that. You can do some funky loops with with crap with queer and ranger and stuff with that um next on our list we'll just move on those are not much more to say about them both very good cards survival of the fittest now this one i have a love hate with a relationship with uh one green and one enchantment for one green mana discard a creature card search your library for a creature card reveal that card put it in your hand then shuffle your library so there you go it's a reanimator I mean, enabler or just a, a fix your creature combo enabler it's a repeatable tutor, which by itself is pretty good if you're in a creature-based combo. You're like, running this in, like, Minsk, it's like, yeah, I can go get this thing and that thing and this thing and, you know, have all the Needle pieces and, without yep. having Hulk or whatever. So, yep, it's um, a one-and-a-half card combo because you need this card and you need a creature in hand. So you don't have to cast a creature in hand. That's your right. half card. This is your one card. Except that is for a the lot of biggest, biggest downfall is having to discard something to get the next thing but that's kind of the same regard as like birthing pod and that's why it's played in decks that run birthing pod or vivian because you're in the same regard like birthing pod is like sacrifice this thing get a thing that's better or neoform or eldritch evolution all of these evo decks that do that sort of thing want cards like this because they can go okay well it, instead of having to play this out and then sacrifice it to x y or z thing to get the next thing now instead i just discard it and go get whatever the fuck i want and in that regard it's less limited than the birthing pod because the birthing pod or the yasan or the whatever requires those certain uh, pr parameters to be met before yeah, you they get all have the their thing. hoops to jump through so in this speak. case it's just okay i discard this land where elves and i go get the fucking card that i need and then i play it so yeah a lot of times you see this one even in like hulk decks they pay a man to discard their hulk mm -hmm. go find their carrying feeder cast their anime dead from hand in their in their carrying feeder and they're off to the races stuff like that so um in creature based combo decks it's a must-have but eh, it's not gonna see play in every single green deck absolutely and it's a, it's another one of those it can be your combo enabler to win which is why it's good enough to make this list uh, the fifth spot is where we don't exactly agree. And is Lane, what is your your choice for spot five? <clears throat> I picked arguably something that is starting to fall into favor. It's Carpet of Flowers. Uh, it's one green. It's an enchantment that says uh, at the beginning of your main phase, and it doesn't specify, so it could be your first or second main phase. Um, it says that you may add X amount of mana of your the color of your choosing based on target opponents amount of islands so essentially if i'm in a, a game with a mono blue player that has three islands out i play this on my upkeep or on my i'm sorry on my main phase i can choose to make three mana of any one color based on the fact that they have three islands so it's a very good ramp spell when you're playing against blue players if you get into a pod which doesn't happen that often, but it does happen. If you get into a pub with no blue players, it is a 100% dead card that just feeds Dockside and you don't play it. You discard it or you hold on to it for the entire fucking game. But 
It's your Chrome Mox fuel, basically, in that scenario. Uh, I mean, like, 80 to 90% of the time, somebody's got blue. And even if they don't have basic islands, they have dual lands. So you're at least getting one to two mana off this every single turn, and that's good enough. It's one man a one mana investment. It's not as reliable as a mana dork. So like mana dork is gonna give you that well so it's it's weird because it gives you the mana immediately, because even if you cast it on your first main, you get it on your second main. Because it has that clause of on a main phase and you don't have yeah, to do it like either way. You can do it on either your first or your main phase. I think the clause is it's uh, the exact wording. If you haven't added mana with this ability this turn, you may do it on any blah, blah, blah during your main phase. So, yeah, right. main phase so, one activated or main phase two. Not so, both, one if you other. play it on main phase one, you can, and a lot of people will do this. They'll play land, this, main phase one, move to main phase two because it's turn one, and they're second or third in turn order, and somebody's already played an island, of course. Uh, they play this, and then they move to second main, and then they get that extra additional mana, and then they go Land of War Elves. So they've now effectively ramped just the same as if they... Uh, they actually better than if they would have just land and then wild growth. Like, they're up a mana, technically. So I think it's still really good. It has fallen out of favor a bit, though, because of the fact that uh, people are playing more and more dual lands. So there are... Unless you're playing against Urza or any other mono blue deck, which Urza is pretty much the one you're probably going to see most of the time, uh, Urza decks, they're going to play a lot of islands because even though they can play a ton of artifacts and they're going to play, maybe they play fetches too, they're still going to be on like 20 lands that are islands. So you're still going to get your, your carpet value. Uh, but I've been in plenty of games where there was no blue players and it just sat. Or there was one blue player that played like uh, City of Brass on their turn one and then I play the carpet and then they just go I'm not going to play basic islands or I'm not going to play islands at all I'm going to play all of these rainbow lands because fuck you and then <laughs> you don't yeah, get I've, shit out of it so I've it is in- it is a thing that's not perfect but I feel like it's still worth putting on the list it's still a very good card there are a lot of games where yeah you're sitting against blue players and they're playing their mana confluence their command tower their rejuvenating springs etc etc and you're you're sitting there for turn after turn and there's no freaking islands in play and you feel real great about it. Uh, if it's holding them off from fir- from fetching up an island, sweet, that's a pseudo stack. I mean, also, if you're fine, on, but... on Faithless Looting or anything else where you can just discard it, that's great. And, or, 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 you know, just anything that is encouraging you to discard cards. Or, like you said, you just sit on it and... I mean, it's not hurting you. It's just, it sucks that it's one of the cards in your 99 and you don't have a way to use it. But... I, it's been very rare. I mean, it's like one out of 30 games, probably, where you're sitting where there's no blue players in the pod. Yeah, like, but it, again, it, even even just a blue player doesn't guarantee there's islands. It really does happen. So I, hear I mean, you. my argument for the card I want to include on the list in the, spot, in the fifth spot is Earthcraft. It's one green and one enchantment. Tap an untapped creature you control. Untapped target basic land. Again, it's a weird juxtaposition. You have to have basics. You have to have the basics of the color that you want that's going to be relevant. I mean, this card, you see it played in... It's a and, combo piece. Yeah, in combo, combo decks. I mean, it can be just a doesn't, pseudo ramp Doesn't spell. Ashaya turn every, everything into a into basic Into a forest. Land? Not yeah. a base. It's just a forest, so sadly. But, I mean, don't they count as basics if they're not uh, non-basic? So, like... Nope. Oh, so they just turn them into... Fo- okay. I'm yeah, it's weird. It's a weird interaction with him. Um, the deck you see, what's the the blue green with shrieking Drake, blue green white band deck? The you talked about it earlier. I think. Yeah, that's the one you see this in a lot of times, and or you used to see this in a lot because shrieking Drake in this, um, and you can do some shenanigans. Ga- Gave, and so. Gave was the one that I got introduced to it from because that was the the Abzan Sapperling goes infinite with a ham sandwich fucking deck that my friend played when we were in the middle of our arms race and uh, he was calling it casual and it was basically like CDH but like <laughs> low end CDH like jank basically uh, as I would rate it today but we were playing like basically upgraded pre so it was pretty fucked to play against um, I've seen it with uh, I want there, there's a combo in Sithis that uses Earthcraft I don't know exactly what it is but 
uh, some of the other decks on the database play it. Um, Ironically, I've I've been killed with an Earthcraft, an Impact Tremors, a stupid Basic Mountain, and a stupid Grinning Ignis before because they tap, they play their Ignis, they tap it, to untap their Mountain, tap their Mountain, bounce their Ignis, recast it, watch when it's a peed. It's ridiculous. Oh, yeah. it's, I mean, it, it's it, hilarious, it, and I felt I felt good and bad at the same time. So. But yeah, I, I, I also, recognize it, it as being a combo piece for sure, and it's, it's a combo piece in a lot of different places, but I would argue that pretty much any deck playing green is playing carpet, whereas Earthcrap, probably not. So I was also going to say the, the new Nissa, the Landfall Nissa, Lotus Cobra, freaking commander in the command zone, also loves Earthcraft. I would yep. concur right now. I think Carpet of Flowers sees more play. Um whether I think it's better or not, or whether I think it should. I, I don't knows, know. I agree. Yeah, I, I'm not arguing that it's a better or worse card. I'm arguing that, like, just the the ramp that it can provide. Like, how many times have you been in a game where, like, there was two blue players, and they both played a mountain, and then, or I'm sorry, an island, and then, you know, you got to drop this and got two extra mana, which, like, cast you an Adnos. Like, sure, but if we're arguing just ramp potential, Earthcraft has a hell of a lot more ramp potential. But sure. I agree. I'll sure. give you Carpet of Flowers as the fifth spot on this one. Although, as they print more and more rainbow lands that aren't islands, I think Carpet of Flowers is definitely, uh, it's definitely falling further and further out of favor. Yeah, it, it's it's declining. I, I will agree with you. But Other honorable mentions we could have thrown in this. We could have said Concordant Crossroads, you know, One Gray Mana, Everything Has Haste. Or we could have said Pattern of Rebirth we talked a little bit about. It's another Hulk yep. deck enabler, etc. But we think... I would say Carpet of Flowers probably belongs fifth spot for now because I do think it sees probably more play and more decks than those. Agreed. It's it's something that I put in every green deck, but it's not necessarily like the best choice. And it could probably be swapped out for another wild growth type effect that costs like two because there are some of those that are some that cost three, there's some that cost four. There, there's a ton of them. Um, it could also be swapped out like if you're in a, a deck that... Uh, you know, wants like the out of time, like you were talking about earlier. Like, there's other enchantments you may consider depending on your colors. So, for uh, sure, uh, we will put the list in the uh, show notes. But uh, yeah, here's our enchantment list. Um, we still have, uh, I believe it was lands. Artifacts and lands, I think. Together. Yeah, we yep. were going to do, uh, so the next couple, uh, when we actually get to the series, the completing the series, um, we were talking about uh, because it, we've been on kind of like 10 or 5, we settled on 25 of the best lands uh, and then uh, 25 artifacts. So uh, some of those may include uh, colored pip artifacts, which we were going to include here, but... <laughs> I'm I'm easily going to take the couple that I could think of, slam those on that list, and uh, the rest of them are probably going to be strictly colorless. <laughs> so, um, either way, thank you all for watching. Uh, if you have any comments about what we have talked about today, let us know. What the fuck was the question earlier? Um, anime dead, dance of the dead, or necromancy? Which is your favorite, and why? That's the question for the week. You guys can let us know. But any other comments? Let us know. Um, comment here on YouTube. You can uh, get in touch with me on Twitter and or uh, comments on Reddit. Like we're, we're posting all over the place. So let us know what you think. Uh, we will see you guys in a couple weeks. Hopefully we'll get the Storm uh, episode recorded. It's kind of dependent on our guests' uh, schedule, but we will get that done. If not, we'll finish off this list. we got some other ideas in the tank. We're back to normal. So... Look for another episode in a couple weeks, and we'll see you guys then. Have Take care, everybody. Rest of your evening.